Hi, beautiful people. Today, our guest is Brendan Kwiatkowski, which is a name I was intimidated to say, but I think I got it. Um, he is a PhD candidate in education. He has an MA in educational studies, special education, and was a secondary school teacher in British Columbia, Canada. He also is a husband and father who loves nature, bouldering, quality conversations, and music. And you are the proud owner of remasculate.org and the Instagram re.masculate. Hi, Brendan. Hi, Brendan. <laughs> Um, we were just talking a little bit in our pre-conversation about a lot of masculine energy that I'm dealing with, particularly today. I'm kind of in a weird, sad, overwhelmed, inundated sort of place. And I am a spiritual gal, and it seems like it's no coincidence that we happen to be connecting today. I would love to just hear from you as a general overview of what remasculate.org is about, how it got started, and how what I've just said to you may resonate with you or what kind of thoughts mm. it brings up for you. Yeah, the first thing is just how rare it is for me to talk about this spirituality regarding masculinity as well as the research regarding masculinity um, to talk about that conversation together is exciting for me because those two things are really valuable for me um, and then the term remasculate was kind of a term I um, mean my friend came up with he helped me it's kind of a term that you don't actually know exactly where it lands some people might think it's very rigid toxic restrictive masculinity of like yeah <laughs> remasculate, you need to I don't know, drink beer, let your balls hang low type thing again. Um, and, and, and it was kind of intentional that it can catch people off guard no matter where they sit to go to it. But what I mean is that often emasculating, getting more connected to our emotions can be viewed as a negative thing. And I want to push past a bit further. And then the re part is actually like getting in touch with all of these, with all parts of ourselves, essentially like embodiment of body mind um defragmentization that is a really strengthening progress process and so that's like the strength that remasculate was trying to indicate that the integration of all these parts is a stronger thing than how is commonly perceived when someone a guy is emasculated but yeah. i'm not married to the term i could change it later <laughs> I mean, no, it's really interesting because you had originally uh, connected with me via email. And as soon as I saw the link, it was like, WTF is this? <laughs> but to your point, it makes you click. And I was very, very uh, pleasantly surprised by what I saw. And, um, and your messaging is completely aligned with the messages that I've been giving on God is Gray about embodiment and making sure that we're completely aligned, mind, body, and soul, that we are not separating pieces of ourselves, that we are not feeling like we have to fit into specific gender scripts to just exist, let alone to be accepted by divinity, by God, by our religious communities, et cetera, which has been such an uphill battle for so many people. Yeah, so I'll, I'll pull back for just a moment, um, just how I kind of want to integrate the spiritual and the masculine in this conversation a little bit, is I had this aha moment. I'm not sure how much you follow Father Richard Rohr, mm. um, but he has kind of this theory of human development and how it applies to religions of uh, order, disorder, reorder. And uh, conservatives tend to stay in that order part, kind of more tribalism, things need to be the way they are. Deconstruction is that disorder piece where progressives tend to be. And Richard Rohr thinks that it takes a lot to get to that reorder place. Um, and I knew that, I've read a book about it a couple years ago, and then I just remember that in psychology of men and masculinities, there's a model of um, restrictive masculinity to healthy positive masculinity that follows those three same things. So the first one is kind of uh, traditional, acceptance of traditional gender roles, then it's gender role, ambivalence, confusion, anger. Um, and then once you resolve those psychosocial issues, then you can kind of have a 
healthy, positive masculinity as much as healthy can be defined. Mm. And so um, what I see you doing with God is great and with the men in your lives, um, considering that's not the typical gender role um, for females to lead in that way, is that on both spheres, on the, on the religious, spiritual side, you are um, you're upsetting the order that things were that felt like it made sense to people, that felt like it made sense to men. And it brings up all of these feelings and emotions that, hey, this is not the way things used to be, or this is not the way I was taught or raised things are supposed to be. And so they have to wrestle with what it means on so many different levels to be a man, to know how to relate with women in a different way than they, the messages they grew up receiving. Yeah. Two things coming up for me are when you're talking about the disorder and the chaos, it reminds me of cleaning out a closet, which is something that I'm currently doing and how I just have way too many things shoved in there, things that don't belong there, things that don't actually speak to who I am as a person. Like you could call that the interior of someone's mind that is stuck in these, these ideas. And it's true when you pull everything out and start organizing it, if God forbid you walk out of the room for a second and go back in, it looks like an unholy disaster. But that is a part of the process, that upheaval. It's like you cannot organize and fix things and relate to things truly, or even hold these items up to yourself and be like, does this script fit me anymore? Does this narrative actually work for me? Are these things serving mm -hmm. me or do I need to get rid of them? And the only way to do it, like I said, is to have this huge upheaval and then placing it back in the closet and making sure you're only taking what actually resonates with you and what's actually important. And I can only imagine how difficult that would be for a man. Yeah, I, it reminds me of like gender roles or people in traditional marriages or thinking like the man works, the woman stays at home. So many people feel like that fits for them, um, but so many people don't. And it's not even that black and white because I loved using this story from uh, my master's research, working with boys with social emotional issues in high school, is that the like alpha male, the most alpha male-ish of that group um, talked about how he loves painting his little sister's nails with nail polish. And I asked the other boys like, what about you? Like, have, have you, do you ever do something like that? Would you like to do something like that? And one of the other boys was like, I don't even know, I've never even entertained the thought to know whether that's something I would like to do or not. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes a lot of people fight like, no, traditional gender roles work for me, they work for my relationship. But that's because we're so detached and disembodied from ourselves from such a young age of, well, yeah, it might, maybe it is okay in your relationship, but you have to get to the point of actually unpacking maybe you were a five-year-old boy that loved to dance and couldn't and there's just so many different layers to unpack it's okay being a stereotypical male i do believe that in in many terms but my i would identify the problem is that when you have a rigid and restrictive view of masculinity so i said the root of it is when um like it's okay if you're a less emotionally expressive male but if you feel like you have to be emotionally inexpressive and you can't access your emotions. When it becomes rigid, that's a problem. And when it becomes rigid for other people. So if your wife has to stay at home, be with the kids, um, that's rigid. If you've come to the point, like even right now, my wife does work, but like while I'm doing my PhD, things do look a bit more traditional from the outside perspective. But we've come to a point where that we've reached that. We've kind of had to deconstruct and then reconstruct where we're going to be. And that's, a, yeah. it's a tough thing for people to know. Yeah. And I love that you bring that up too, because it's, it's just, it's a lot like the reconstruction journey of Christianity. If someone reconstructs, you can reconstruct and be like, yeah, I want to be a stay at home mom and do the dishes. Like that mm. is a permissible conclusion to come to not only permissible, but I think it fits into the kaleidoscope of who we are as human beings, where we la land on these gender scales, which even now gender is becoming such a convoluted, complicated 
even silly and irrational thing to me because when I look at all of these constructs, I'm like, what does it actually mean to be a woman? I've been paying my own bills since I was 19 years old. Isn't that masculine? Does that make me more masculine? And why is that supposedly a masculine trait? And is that not just based in this patriarchal idea that women wouldn't have been capable of doing that or weren't even invited into spaces where we could actually fend for ourselves in this world? Yeah, it's all so much comes down to how we define things of patriarchy, viewing men as producers, women as reproducers. How do we define work? Work is something outside, whereas women who stay at home are definitely working, depends on how you define it. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, very, yeah. um, very unfair in how things are defined and how we term things as masculine or feminine. I don't mean to even be so gendering in this conversation. I feel like non-binary people, queer people have always not fit into these scripts. Yeah. So I guess, would you say that your work really hones in specifically on like the cisgender straight male or is it? Um, my PhD research is open to non-binary and transgender uh, men as well, but primarily that is the, the main target is cis heterosexual male. Yeah. And I, I've, for me, and please tell me from your PhD perspective, like for me, the reason is because a lot of cisgender straight men haven't had to have a reckoning with some of these thoughts and ideas because if you just fit into that script that society originally places you in or if supposedly you do then you kind of don't have to wrestle with it and reckon with it the way a trans person would or queer person non-binary etc and you might not realize how toxic these things are to yourself But with the guy yelling in the street, well, you're ugly anyway, Mm -hmm. that I would be so curious to hear like what that means when it hits your ears or what you would feel if you saw a situation play out like that. Because I just see so much wrestling with men. I, I, and even in my own life in my progressive city in Los Angeles, where it seems like men kind of don't know what to do with us anymore. Because they're like, well, you're making your own money and sometimes you're making more than me and you have all these opinions and where do I fit in? And I'm none of these um, marginalized people. So Mm -hmm. am I even allowed to speak on certain issues? And to me, sometimes I feel like that's where that frustration bursts from. Like, well, you're ugly anyway. It's kind of like, I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to forfeit, say something, part of my friend's shitty, and then just like, keep on on this toxic journey of mine (laughs) Uh, yeah i think you've nailed that there's a lot of confusion around it and it reminds me of a quote that um that patriarchy is presented in our society and in culture as like all powerful but most men don't feel all powerful and so there's a huge disconnect of like it's hard because whenever you mention like privilege it's like, even if you say it very clearly, that privilege doesn't mean anything, not that you've been void of struggle in your life. Even if you say that clearly, it still feels that way to so many boys and men that I've talked to and researched. Yeah. And, and so if we can get past that for a moment, um, yeah, the first things that come to mind is that there's a lot of confusion. Um, they're here, all of these mixed messages from so many places um could be on uh, a podcast that men tend to listen to could be in men's groups on facebook i'm part of a lot i kind of do lots of observation um but there is a a lot of research that women do like certain hyper masculine traits in sexual partners and there's lots of research to the contrary that like feminist men have better sex than non-feminist men Um, But in a lot of these men groups, uh, there's a lot about taking charge of your own sexuality and like going out there. So a lot of men hearing those messages and they, and women are conflicted too, in some senses as well. And I'm sure the types of sexual advantage, uh, if you see in the culture, like things like the, the playboy uh, many women womanizer 
ideal is still normalized heavily um, in, in our culture and our society. And so men, boys growing up seeing those messages, they're still idolizing that to some extent, but they're told to be sensitive as well. But then yeah. sometimes when that sensitivity comes out, it's called, it's, women have this, it's called double binds for women. Um, there's so many of double binds. The double bind for boys particularly is be emotionless, except then when you're in a relationship, be very sensitive and attuned. And if you haven't developed those skills of how to be that way, it's going to be really hard to be that way. So there's just yeah. lots of messages everywhere that are confusing for anyone, regardless of what gender you identify with. Yeah. And I've observed too, in like those MGTOW kind of groups and stuff, mm. um, I see it, this, this huge frustration with like, again, the gender scripts, I think it was kind of, it feels kind of like, wait, you're saying you don't want me to have any ownership or control of you. You don't want me to head a household but you still do want me to open the door and you want to be fully sexually available and promiscuous as you want. But then you also want me to honor you as a wife, which I've been told in my gender script, you're supposed to be for me. Your body is supposed to be mine, but now I'm supposed to be okay with you doing whatever you want before you meet Mm. me. And then I'm just supposed to forgive you and move on. And then all of the egoic things that I can only imagine come into that, like, if a man is not comfortable with a woman's sexuality, or even if a woman has had a pretty dark and complicated sexuality like mine, trust me, I've encountered so many men who have said they would never be with me. Again, in my book, On Her Knees, a one man I fell in love with told me I could never marry a whore. And he was talking about me. And, you know, so it's just like all of these super complicated issues bouncing off of each other because it's true. I went into rampant promiscuity because I was trying so hard to break free of my gender script and my religious script. And it was painful in so many ways, but I didn't have the balance. And then I feel like what it brought into and in my life and my romantic relationships were men that were mirroring that and and kind of reminding me yeah you are not worth as much anymore because of these choices you'd made Mm -hmm. and i don't even know how to unpack Mm -hmm. all of those issues but it seems like as both parties begin to break out of these normative gender roles both parties are left feeling really confused and i'm very open too about saying that hookup culture absolutely did not serve me that is not Mm -hmm. something i recommend And I don't mean sleeping with people out of like enthusiastic consent and joy. I mean, just like Mm -hmm. being really, you know, dismissive of people and my own body and stuff. But the culture, like you said, is bringing us all of these mixed messages. And I see both parties really lost in the mess of it. Yeah. And you know, like the quote comparison is the thief of joy. And where I see most of this conversation devolve the most is when men are looking at hurt other people as like, well, they're doing this. Why can't I do this? Um, Or women, even at men, um, like it's a, it doesn't further the conversation. I understand why people do that, but it really points down to the core thing of being, we're disembodied from ourselves and we're like trying to use head knowledge of trying to figure out how to be sexual when we have to, learn that ourselves and trust our own sexuality first and that is a a way harder thing to take ownership but it's ironic that someone like jordan peterson can say on a podcast that men are monsters and men but they hear that as like a call to like we're powerful and need to tame the monster within us and then the other messages um let's say from the left um that like men need to improve masculinity is a problem or on the extreme end you might hear some people say like i hate all men or something like that i have seen that on twitter and they take super offense and shame to that so you can have this messages of men are monsters and some men can grab onto that and be like that feels empowering and then you can get like i guess it the other message brings men into their shame um way more and shame is a complicated thing because there's, 
um, I was just talking to one of my friends. I'm not sure if you've talked to her, Gabe's, but talking about how shame, it's, it's great to avoid unnecessary shame, but you can't always, it's impossible to control people's feelings of shame if they come up from things that you say. Mm -hmm. And so I have no doubt that what you're doing in your life brings up shame for so many men and, not, and Christians, and they don't know what to do with it, and they might not even be in touch with their shame. Um, but shame can be a teacher if we let it. Mm. I don't think we need to avoid it at all costs because I think that yeah, we can learn from our shame if we choose to. Yeah, I love, I love that distinction because I always talk about shame and conviction being different. And I do absolutely mm. believe that. Like when we are in our, in our highest minds and we feel convicted about something, I truly mm. believe that doesn't invite shame because it's so it's so much out of love and it mm. feels so genuine and real and it hits you just straight in the heart but at the same and i i would say the same thing like avoid shame at all costs or not avoid it i have been framing it by saying invitation like shame will knock on your door like a vampire and be like can i come in like you'll have conviction like oh, I shouldn't have spoken to that woman that way. That could be a true mm -hmm. sense of conviction inside of you. But then shame will be right around the corner. Like, and do you want to feel bad about that for the rest of the day? <laughs> you know? Yes. And they're always like at play with each other. And so I think you're totally right that it brings you messages. And I also just heard a podcast between Sophia Spolino and Rev Carla, who's someone that's big on TikTok and she's amazing. And she was talking about how a lot of the work that a lot of us are doing, you're doing as well, is holding up mirrors to people mm -hmm. and how excruciating that can truly be. We've all had that experience. And if someone's not ready to hear something, they will knock the mirror out of your hand mm -hmm. and it'll feel like it's at the expense of the messenger. So I think I'm really curious to hear from you. Twofold is like one when men any man that's listening if if someone is feeling that sensation of shame and mm. your immediate reaction or knee-jerk reaction is to attack or go on the mm -hmm. defense shout you're ugly anyway that sort of behavior mm -hmm. then what do you suggest that men do in response to that and how do they process that in a healthier way? Because it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that seems like almost the first part of the journey. Like with AA, like until you admit there's a problem, how are you actually going to conquer that beast, mm. aim that monster, so to speak? Yeah. Oh, it's so interesting um, about knowing where is the first step of that journey. I do think it's a bit different. Um, we can talk about my PhD research later because I came with a hypothesis thinking that I had the first step or the most important step for gender equality and it wasn't quite what I expected. Okay. Um, but um, going back to your question is that ideally I would love to tell men feel in their bodies what their bodies feel like when they feel shame. And to know this one cog cognitive piece is that um, anger, especially like uh, physical anger, like lashing out, maybe that's, a, that's a kind, of, kind of type of violence, I would say, like a verbal energetic lashing out. Um, or ladies, raise your hand if you've had a man punch a wall. <laughs> oh yeah, the boys I've worked with, so many of them have broken fingers from lockers. <laughs> Oh man. Poor boy. I mean, you boys go through it. I know. But but then we're there in the mess. Oh, totally. And our energy is just going everywhere. And and the the real why that happens is because that's one of the easiest and quickest ways to prevent feelings of shame is to externalize it, mm -hmm. is to get it out there. And so um like recognizing in our bodies, like when we get angry, um, there's something called the window of tolerance. Um, which is just a model for like, we kind of operate in ups and downs inside a regulatory window where we experience highs and lows that are normal. Then, then we get hyper aroused um, and we kind of lash out or we get hypo aroused where we kind of numb, totally zone out. And ladies raise your hand if a man stormed out of the house and like driven away for hours. <laughs> That's like the opposite end of it. 
Yeah, and if our windows can be so low if, um, for many reasons, but so many times, like I, the boys I've worked with can be in a hypo aroused state and go directly to the hyper aroused state of fighting, but trying to recognize what that feels like in your body to see some signs beforehand. And like one of the boys I worked with, like his big breakthrough was instead of breaking his fingers or yelling at his mom, was just to, when his mom was yelling at him, was just to be silent and be still and calm. Like for him, that's a step forward to just breathe and, and walk away. So there, it's not like there's a cookie cutter. This is the process and exactly what healing looks like all the time. Um, but I think, yeah, the connection to our bodies, but we're so disconnected from our bodies, which is why um, if you get me on a pessimistic day, I think that's like, I think that's the key. How do we get there? There's so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And maybe I will speak to my research. I, inter I researched 170 uh, at late adolescents, age 17 to 19 boys, 170. I screened them based on their levels of emotional restriction. And I interviewed the 10 least emotionally restricted and the 10 most emotionally restricted to see what their experiences and beliefs about masculinity, how they compared. The boys that were emotionally expressive were way more likely um, to do help seeking behaviors, ask for help, reach out to community members around them. And that helped them out in many different ways. Mm -hmm. But if you look at other trajectories, like there is still homophobia in both groups. There was still a high... Um, belief in violence in both groups. Um, a lot of the masculine norms, which I did quantitatively and qualitatively, are still upheld in both groups. Because I was thinking emotions is the key thing, and I do think that's very important. But it's not like the emotionally restricted boys, some of them were super huge social justice advocates um, and were super into gender equality and against homophobia. So it wasn't this cooker cutter of like, if we tell boys to cry, it's going to heal everything. That's just one part of the embodiment process that has to happen. Mm, yeah. Oh my gosh. I'll give you something to cry about is something that might. I might cry. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so excruciating. And that, like you said, it all goes back to this lack of embodiment. And it's so fascinating to me when I learned that the root word Satan means the divider, because oh. in that, notion all of a sudden it all clicked and i was like who wouldn't want boys to cry who wouldn't want girls to dance and move their hips like when you find out mm -hmm. these things are necessary catharsis that people that engage embodiment behaviors will you know have lower rates of cancer and sickness mm -hmm. and disease because they're just in their body and how truly quote satanic it is to divide us in that way and tell us these things aren't okay you're also reminding me of this TikTok that I just stumbled on yesterday. And it was like, uh, I forget what it calls when you like duet with somebody. Mm. And one was like this hyper masculine dude, like with his khakis and his hat on. And he was swatting a bug on the wall and was just like, oh, I got it or whatever. Just up in his quote masculinity, whatever the hell that's even supposed to mean anymore. And then there was a second video of a man, a kid who was like dancing around his living room with a cup and a piece of paper. And he went up to the bug on the wall, put it in the cup and then just like kept dancing and like put the bug outside. Mm. And my whole entire being melted and was just like, that is what I want to see in this world. That, that level of compassion. And also too, though, that like, flexing in a totally different way like the first boy was flexing on his video game masculinity and the second boy was flexing on his wokeness and empathy and you know i don't know where those boys lie like do both boys go down on women or not do mm -hmm. both boys identify themselves as straight or queer or whatever mm -hmm. like which is interesting that you're saying there's so much variation from person to person and you can't really specifically nail it down. Yeah, it's interesting because I anecdotally have seen some men come to it at a way I would never anticipate or they can get a glimpse of it. Um, is that like sometimes when they, like I think it's a, a very restrictive form of masculinity and dangerous form at times to view our bodies like a weapon. 
Um, but some people like hone their ability to fight and stand up for them really well. And often there's a shift on some of those men that they realize once they get to that point that they don't need to. And then there's this gentleness about them um, that seems like kind of like, for lack of a better word, like a more mature masculinity as opposed to the men that are striving for that and want to destroy with that skill. Yeah. Um, so there is a different way to, yeah, a different process to get to it. But it reminds me of what you said of the part in the re research. Um, they call it the boy crisis. And the boy crisis happens around the age of five um, when boys really internalize a lot of gender roles and gendered messages. And that actually happens before girls. Um, girls' as gender crisis is around 13 when essentially when they become sexualized by society. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of hypothesis of that, like boys have actually been disembodied for longer. Like it's more acceptable for a girl to be a tomboy than it is for a boy to be a girly girl. Totally. Um, but one of the things in the research is fathers lamenting the loss, yeah, the loss of the innocence and the sensitivity in their sons because there's like an inevitable sense that as they go through the world, they're going to lose this. And I think fatherhood is also part of the research where men can get reconnected to their vulnerability to themselves. Um, it is a very powerful time in a lot of men's lives, according to the research. And I'll speak for myself as well. Um, it shouldn't have to just be through fatherhood that we get reconnected. It, I love that men do get reconnected through fatherhood, but it shouldn't just, we shouldn't have to rely on something so substantial to get connected to yeah. our embodiment and other people's empathy. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and it could go either way still because I'm just thinking of all of those memes and, and guys that take pictures of their daughter at prom with a huge mm. shotgun and that disconnect too. I'm like, Fuck. do you realize if you would just raise your boys to not hurt us, you wouldn't have to guard your daughters with shotguns. It's like those same guys that are going to hold the shotgun are the same guys that sent toxic boys into the world. And they're the same guys that get upset if you say that masculinity needs to be critiqued because <laughs> they obviously know it needs to be critiqued if they're worried about what other boys are going to do to their daughters. Yeah, I know. Can I also say, did you just have a little allergy spell or did you get choked up? Oh, I got choked up for sure. I, could I ask you why that, that specific moment touched you? I know you're a father of twins, but why specifically does that bring you to tears? Well, I think of my own religious deconstruction process is that the most dangerous message or harmful message that I've had to work to overcome is the belief that at my core I'm evil. And, um, and I think that that connects to like, there's almost like this within Christianity sometimes stronger, there's like this hands up of like, the world is sinful, we are sinful, we are told depravity, nothing. Um, that's just the way it is until we get to heaven or something like that. And I just think, that we have to fight a bit stronger to be connected that we are i believe that we actually are, like the inherent goodness in us mm. trumps and supersedes anything negative um, that the world brings so it's going to take courageous parents um, to raise children children who but it's also going to be dangerous to an extent for our children when i did my master's defense um, the Dean of Education at a university in Canada said, like, what you're doing is dangerous. And I didn't quite know what he meant, but he was like, um, we live in social contextual worlds that getting people to be embodied is dangerous. One, because our parents or our family's origin might not be safe for us. We might face judgment. Um, boys may be, I don't want to compare, but maybe harsher than girls, as well as just being embodied or empowered is so threatening to other people. And I like to think that it's because it reminds them of how disembodied they are and that their bodies are like fighting, wanting to get connected to that. They're like drawn to it and they push away because it's tough work. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're just reminding me yesterday, I think on NPR or something, I was listening to interviews about um, in Syria about a lawyer who is dealing with like a thousand rape cases where soldiers are coming in and just assaulting women and young girls and that there's no there's no justice for it it's just rampant it's just happening and that was so disturbing to me because i can see it so clearly in my spiritual mind like you feel so powerless that you need your guns and your weapons and your shield of armor and you know whatever is protecting you to maintain this false idea of your power and there's nothing that shows less power in a man than assaulting a little girl you mm -hmm. think you're in your power mm -hmm. you are out of your mind you are so far gone and I, it was disturbing to me because I was thinking if I was in a situation where I had to protect myself or other women, how would you even go about protecting yourself when you know you are, you are dealing with people that cannot be reasoned with because they are so in their toxicity and they are so in their fear and their shame and whatever else it is that is driving and compelling that truly abhorrent behavior like what do you do about that that obviously is toxic masculinity at its worst and mm -hmm. we're dealing with it in all levels of society and i don't know like do you have any advice for the woman that is standing there watching the man punch the wall watching the guy storm around the house dealing with a man's hands coming at us or their bodies dominating or overpowering our bodies how do you reason with it with someone in a moment like that and can you how do men heal from this toxicity yeah there's gonna be a lot of different things that are i'm not sure if you might not even agree with all of them or let's see how they land no, speak your truth do your but thing. um well, once someone's activated in something like, yeah, they need to come down before the blood flows to the brain that they can kind of be embodied um, enough to listen. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's like um, the research shows that women and my own research shows that the men who got are most emotionally expressive um, it's a theme in my research called um, the importance of emotional safe havens. And my sub theme is that females are important emotional safe havens. So for most of these boys who are emotionally um, expressive, it's women in their lives that have modeled that or have brought a level of safety because they haven't felt judgment from women in their lives. And I think that's beautiful, but also I understand the perspective of like women shouldn't have to do the emotional work for men. Um, so like my, my one message that I will be clear to women as not a woman myself would be um, not to judge, because there's also research that shows that women actually do judge and kind of have a complicated feeling when men are super vulnerable. Um, yeah. And so that would be a clear thing is like, and it's in all these men groups, there's a huge message of like, women don't want to parent you they don't want to be your child and i get that but we all have child wounds and child parts that in my understanding of a healthy relationship that like a mutual couple understands that sometimes our child parts are going to be activated and we need to support each other um but i would just say don't disdain and be a safe person yeah be a safe person for when men do show emotions um but i think a lot of the work is done um, in men and through men as well. I don't actually, I understand toxic masculinity and I would actually define it as a smaller category. I don't use that term for multiple reasons. I prefer restrictive masculinity, 
I think restrictive masculinity gets at what's going on at the root. I think there's less shame associated with it. That mm -hmm. said, I do think behaviors, like what you said, rape would be the, probably the extreme example that behavior, un, or restrictive masculinity in its most rigid form turns into behaviors that are toxic. So that would be what toxic masculinity is. But I know that my work with men already, they might've turned off this conversation because I haven't clarified that. But there's unfortunately some terms that do put up people's defenses that I understand why those terms are used. But I also feel like trying to get people to come sit at the table um, so that they can hear at least a little bit to understand. Yeah. I may, I just wrote that down for myself because I may try to adopt that or if not entirely adopt it because I agree, like I don't like when something becomes a quote liberal catchphrase mm. and then you know that people immediately can't hear you. From the beginning mm. of God is Grey, I've avoided certain terminology that I knew would instantaneously turn off an evangelical, for example. Mm. And, um, and I have been trying really hard to figure out how to invite men in these conversations. I've been doing a lot of work geared towards men recently. Mm -hmm. And Peggy Ornstein said it too. She was like, I never wanted to study men or boys because they were mm -hmm. the problem. And then I realized, oh my God, if we could solve that problem, they would stop hurting us. Mm -hmm. And- yeah, Oh, sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. Okay, there's two things I don't wanna forget is that one of the things is um, there's this irony that men take up a lot of uh, linguistic space in conversations as well. But the common thing in the research and the literature is that men don't feel like they're heard or listened to. Mm -hmm. So there's that whole dynamic going on, which like isn't fair from an external point of view. But, but even the boys I interviewed feel like girls have a place to process. Their boys don't have anywhere to process. Um, and then the second thing, if I can remember it, um, is that, yeah, there's a major disclaimer if people are getting activated or women listening to this getting activated, um, just because it's a tough balance between empathy, but women need to speak, like, if you think of like indigenous reconciliation, it's truth and reconciliation, and that's the order. There needs to be truth and women have to speak. There's a lot of anger that women collectively hold and that is a truth that needs to be heard um, and needs to be expressed, especially for women. Um, but I find in my, I was used to be a high school teacher when I talked about masculinity and I was teaching a university course this last year, is that the females in the class are very quick to understand, to empathizing with males experiences. Um, so like, even if, like I had so many girls crying. I showed them the movie, The Mask You Live In, um, realizing like, I did this to my brother. I told them these harmful messages. So it's very, so I wanna say that um, research-wise anecdotally, there is also a phenomenon that females, even if they are perpetuating restrictive forms of masculinity that hurt men, they also are fairly quick to recognize that when exposed to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think men, yeah, we need to be a bit quicker in that way and like so what do we know from the research is that role models male healthy male role models um is really important for boys uh, um, no offense boys but those seem hard to come by because it's like there used to be you know for so many years it was these gargantuan church leaders mark mm -hmm. driscoll is supposed to be someone a man is supposed to look up to and it's it's all so restrictive can you define restrictive masculinity in your terms for me yeah so i, I restrictive masculinity was like really the word rigid if there's rigid restrictions placed on what men and women can or cannot be so um in my research um, a major reason why boys don't choose to share their emotions is because they think that being a man they have to shoulder that responsibility. Um, yeah. But I will, the reason why actually I like restricted masculinity is because like, so there's kind of three messages about masculinity that if they're rigid are the most harmful and that's emotional restriction. That's um, a, 
autonomy, meaning like I have to do everything myself. And the third one is like aggression, dominance, toughness. So those kind of three categories and why I like restrictive is because all of those have a place in time. Like sometimes it's advantageous to be emotionally restricted. Actually, I would argue based on my own research is that every boy who's emotionally restrictive has a really good reason for being that in the first place. That um, often it was through divorce that they learned, I, I got to keep it in. Um, they were judged harshly by other people. Um, so they had, there's a good reason for being restricted at a time, but realizing- Good reason as in like- um, A psychological- a valid, thing. understandable reason, not like a positive reason yes um they're yeah like it for the protection and safety of themselves as a child it was safer for them not to be emotionally expressive yeah gotcha um but i would say that um sometimes it can be helpful to not be emotionally um to have a certain level of emotional restriction at certain times like um there was a rat that was dying it got dropped by an eagle before me and my wife from the sky and it was dying (laughs) and so like in order to in that moment it's not like women can't do this by any means I'm not saying that at all but tapping in to like I have to go kill it put it out of its misery (laughs) that is a certain level of like I don't know emotional restriction to like I have to do this I can't be fully engaged in the suffering of this animal at this time Ugh, you're just um, pulling on my heartstrings and my desire to see the world change because I was just thinking of how much we could learn from each other when we finally find ourselves in some sort of center. All of the years and years and years of practice women have had being emotionally available and able to process our emotions and in safe circles where we're allowed to just like lay on the floor and cry in front of all of our friends. I wish men had that same space. And then you though, like, because now I am a single mom, Mm. I find myself relating more and thinking more about the male experience because when you're talking about, well, it doesn't feel like a privilege just because I'm a man. It's like, that's true. It is incredibly stressful. And if I didn't have the tools of my emotional, my, my emotionally positive, beautiful, familial relationships with my friends where I can process some of these emotions, if I didn't have my spiritual practice where I knew I could sit down and that there was something divine taking care of me instead of just myself. These are all tools that I have to survive this very, very scary thing, which is like, how do I keep this roof over my my child's head? How do I make sure we're safe? How do I make sure that no one's going to come through the door? Like I've thought about that too. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm laying in bed by myself, I'm like, well, now it's just me. And I feel that weight. And like I said, it's because I have the tools of my quote femininity that I feel like I'm able to be in that power. But I also wish I had more male mentors in my life to be like, well, this is how you deal with killing that rat. Because in certain situations, I would be the one that would have to do that. And I don't know how to healthily separate myself from that because I'm so engaged in the emotional and Mm -hmm. I don't know that was kind of tangential but it's like we all need these tools in a different variation in different ways and with God is great too I choose to be emotionally restrictive um because I don't I don't I know not everybody needs my entire emotional life just laid out on the table I'm simply doing my work and I have emotions but I've learned to table them, which, which feels very empowering. So I know exactly what you mean. And social media is a terrible place for nuance, but the reality is there's a lot of nuance in these conversations. And I think, yeah, sometimes terms viewing, it doesn't match men's experiences because they've seen times in their lives where being tough, emotionally stoic and independent has been advantageous. So then when someone says these things are wrong, it's like, I think it's important. It's the restrictive rigidity of those things that Mm -hmm. those can't be experienced, that you have to be that certain way. 
Interesting. Yeah. But what you but it reminds me of, of role models. There's something else in the research um, that's true of my PhD research as well is that, and you see this actually enacted even like Justin Baldoni's new book. Um, I'm not sure if you saw it. No. Um, he's the actor in Jane the Virgin. Uh, he wrote okay. a book called Man Enough. Um, there's this theme in the research that men who embody some aspect of normative masculinity are more able to influence other male, other men. So especially when it comes to athleticism and looks, like if I think Dwayne the Rock Johnson, um, if he speaks about feminism and he does spend, speak about gender equality, he's going to get way less pushback. More men are going to listen to him than if some person looking nerdy is going to do it, which is unfortunately the reality of the social dynamics that often are at play. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting. It's like gay straight alliances in schools only reduce bullying if um, heterosexual or if high standing heterosexual males are part of it. Wow. Mm. So it is the responsibility of heterosexual males to be part of it. And there's this weird thing of like, if you are athletic or you're kind of hijacking your standing on one part of traditional masculinity i don't like the term traditional masculinity either because it gives a sense that it's static when you look through human history it's not actually as traditional as we think totally that could be another conversation yeah <laughs> but um i kind of lost my train of thought. oh yeah it's like here are some traits that are actually advantageous for other men like the fact that i love sports i know that when i was at a high school if i cried in front of the boys they'd wouldn't lose respect for me unless if I like there might be people watching this see me crying view that as weakness um I am this optimistic though I'm an optimist that I could meet any male or man in a room one-on-one -on -one and we could hear each other out um but it's yeah it's everything is in context and unfortunately we still listen to people who um who give us the illusion of an authority figure, which is why we trust British accents sometimes more than not. <laughs> this is a total aside, but I remember when I was in college, I was in Philly and there was one British student and I remember it was a philosophy class and sometimes she would say the most idiotic things and even the teacher was like, yes. And I was like, do you want me to say that one more time in a Philly accent? Cause it doesn't sound the same. <laughs> but yeah totally. it's true but also what you're saying is feels so complicated for me because it's like if anything so many of us that are not a heteronormative men are trying to get out from under these repressive systems that have mm -hmm. been led by men so it's like it's so complicated even for me and my platform to stand in some sort of space where I'm saying, yes, let's now embolden heterosexual men to be a mm. part of these movement because we need their leadership still. And, mm. um, and I don't yeah. really know what to do with those conflicting ideas in my head. Yeah, that, thank you for voicing that. Cause I think, um, like I definitely have the opinion that like gender equality is like we all need to raise together and that it's not one or the other like it is both going together um or all rather yeah all of all rather yes yeah um yeah it's i i definitely had a reaction when you said like we need male leadership it's like we need male leaders for males that's for sure but it's not like um oh but it's not exclusively so <laughs> i heard what i was saying there i was like wait no i mean i don't like how that sounds either we do need more males of course in in other opinions but i've been to feminist conferences as well and there's different perspectives in different parts of the world like some feminist organizations don't want any men in part part of it and i know a lot of feminists here do want men part of feminist movements um yeah because they're worried about men taking over them um, and kind of having a similar patriarchal feel to it. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm having any sol solutions here, but I just do wanna 
clarify that it's not. I mean, we're not going to solve uh, restrictive masculinity in one conversation, but I'm glad we've like got the ball rolling on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, too, I just like, I've been telling people lately in my, in my friend circle that I refuse to take on this lingo of men are trash. Mm. I hate stuff like that. I hate mm. it. I also hate the future as female because mm. I, that, not only does that leave out all other genders, but it's also, mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want the future to be dominated by one thing. I want there to be oneness and unity and equality. So neither of those catchphrases speaks to me. But sometimes the men is tra or trash one does speak to me in my, mm -hmm. like I said, more cynical lower moments, because like, if I'm having what I perceive to be a platonic moment with a guy, and mm -hmm. then he tries to what they call neg me, or, you know, that whole, the thing that I talked about at the top of the conversation, all of a sudden you're like, oh wait, I thought I was in a safe space or I just wanted for one minute to believe that I could sit here and have a conversation with a heterosexual male around my age, which is a complicated demographic and older. Like I have so much hope and faith in Gen Z and everything that they're teaching us because I do see men popping up with more fortitude and strength. And when I say strength, I mean vulnerability, really. Like one of the most healing experiences I ever had, which I wrote about in my book, sorry to keep plugging it. But you know, my book is really about toxic relationships. And a lot of it is about men, of course, mm -hmm. because it's about my sexuality. And um, after a man I had loved called me a whore and said he would never marry me because of my sexual past, there was a younger person. I think he was like 21 at the time and I was 30 or something. And we were watching something on TV and, um, this woman was at the gynecologist office. It was like a comedy preview or something. And she's in the stirrups and the guy now is like, how many people have you had sex with? And she's like, this week, <laughs> you know, just like a stupid joke. Mm. And he said, what a whore. And it ended up being one of the most healing moments of my entire life because he was joking. Uh. And I never heard a heterosexual dude make a joke like that and actually, in my mind, by infusing humor into it, he was acknowledging the ridiculousness mm -hmm. of calling a woman a whore in general. And it was like exactly what my spirit and my body needed. It started me into a transition of healing from some of those experiences mm -hmm. with men. And I still count him as a very sexually healing experience in my life. Um, again, that, a tangent, but what does that bring up for you? It brings up a couple of real, uh, so many important things, but it reminds me for foremost is that I don't think any healing journey is void of joy. And I think your the humor, how powerful humor can be in healing is that I think in any healing stage, there is that point of, of, of joy or of elation that, um, we could <laughs> feel in our bodies as well. Um, the other thing it brings up for me is kind of like, you know how like I started with like order, disorder, reorder. It's kind of like telling men like, why do we want to get at reorder? Like, why are we even trying to get at this place? Like you can look externally, like, because then there'll be less violence against women and children. That's a great reason. There's another yeah. great reason of there'll be less male suicides, which is super high. So that can be like yeah. a more internal one, but it's not presenting it. Like if you reach this health, lack of a better term, like a positive masculinity, whether that's no masculinity, femininity at all, or whether that's like, I have both the masculine energy and feminine energy in me. Um, I can, it's not restrictive. It really, it's not like life is going to be easier. And in some ways it could be harder. Like for instance, if I was a patriarchal father parent right now, I could do my PhD way faster with way more publications than with newborn twins in a pandemic at home right now. And it's like, there's a part of me that's like, oh, that gender role is enticing to a certain degree. Mm. But then there's, but this also describes me as well, is that there's also research that just came out in Britain that because of the pandemic, 
men who've stayed home, like 68% of them want to do more work at home primarily because they like being with their children. Like it reconnects them with something that they've been missing. And so just really going back to a positive, healthy masculinity doesn't mean your life is easier. It means that it's worth doing because it's more fulfilling. It's more like the integration of our bodies and our minds and the divine all together. And it's seeing the human in us and seeing the human in other people. And that's definitely a, a mm -hmm. target that I think is worth striving for. Yeah. That's beautiful. That I love how you brought up the external and, and the internal battles because that is why my heart breaks for men. And like we've talked about this whole time, I love how complicated a conversation like this is because you, you don't want to give too much to someone that has perpetrated violence mm. or hatred or fear or wall punching or any of that. And at the same time, there's a reason and there's a root. There's a tree that has rotten fruit on it. And we are trying to figure out how to uproot this tree and make it blossom into something beautiful, which means that less men would be taking their own lives and taking the lives of the women and children around them, which are both, like you said, statistically rampant problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we could talk for 10 years and I would love to do that. And let's keep in touch and let's revisit the conversation, especially as your research continues to grow. I would love to check back up. Even as a mother of a boy, I would mm -hmm. love to keep in touch and have some of those conversations as well. But um, because we, a lot of the vitriol and complication that I experience as I speak out on subjects is about sexual freedom and women's sexuality. And I've been saying for so long that whenever I t speak positively about masturbation, mm -hmm. I will have men sliding into my DMs or emailing me with hatred. Like, mm. how dare you tell us it's okay to masturbate? Mm. And then like we saw, we keep talking about the Atlanta spa shootings mm. and how we all in purity culture really see that as a manifestation of what purity culture does and his over-sexualization of Asian women and the repression of whatever sexuality that he had burgeoning inside of him. Um, all of this is so complicated, but I would love to end on your thoughts about male sexuality and just all of the struggles that you guys go through in this department and how it hurts us. Yeah, and I'll talk more specifically from a Christian perspective or upbringing, um, is that the conversation about male sexuality really gets reduced to pornography and I'm not gonna get into ethical porn versus not. Hopefully we can all be against the sexual trafficking in pornography. For the love of God, yes. <laughs> um, I'll start there, yes. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, but so often for men, and females are pretty much ignored from this conversation in church about pornography. But for men, everything gets reduced to your lust life and really pornography. And that's kind of this externalization of how well you have your sexuality in check or not. Um, and so often we rely on women Oh, that's the messaging to help get us in check. Um, and uh. <laughs> well, I kept featuring this guy. Um, I don't even know who he is, but he I put him in my um, male purity culture video. And he is specifically talking about porn and he battles everything as a warrior. And he is super buff and has a huge mm -hmm. neck. And he's like, you're a warrior. You're gonna war against porn. You're warring against your mind and you're a battle. You're going into battle. And I'm just watching it like, <gasps> and I'm sure that could be valuable in certain elements of life. But watching mm -hmm. that being about this is how you are going to mindfully every day white knuckle it and force your sexuality to become this very restrictive idea of what we are telling you is okay. Mm -hmm. I just know that's going to lead to a disaster. Exactly. And so if porn is used, are looking at it or not looking at it, is used as the metric to how well we can trust our sexuality, that's always going to fail. Is that or most of the time is going to fail. Like I think that there's people that haven't looked at porn for 10 years that don't 
trust that doesn't mean that they trust their sexuality that means that they're really good at not doing one thing and if that fails then their whole sexuality might be in limbo and yeah. so it i think i think the church really needs to help and, and society help men trust their sexuality and it's not just about this external am i looking am i not looking and so how are women and females or other all genders supposed to trust heterosexual cis males sexualities when many of us don't trust our own right. because we don't know what that would be like to actually decide for ourselves about masturbation or pornography as opposed to just this like i feel shame when this happens is that because of the shame messages i've received or is that like a genuine conviction inside of me not to look at that and i think so often it's just here's a clear line presented to us and so we don't trust ourselves because it's from an external source yeah and also the measure of what is moral and immoral i brought up the mike todd sermon where he uses a slippery slope fallacy mm. he's a really big uh pastor he has like a best-selling book he's really mm. hip and cool and he's repackaging these stale ass purity culture messages and pretending they're new mike todd they're not i love you but no and um one of the things he brings up as an example is he's like when you're watching porn first you're watching men and women then you're watching men and men and women and women and then you're watching bestiality and then you're watching people eating poop and then you're watching oh what's the p that? word oh, yeah. and it's it, I mean, it's a lie. It's an outright mm -hmm. lie. And again, it plays into what you're talking about, which it's like, how is anyone supposed to trust their sexuality when they're literally being told from platform as recently as a couple months ago by this really hip dude mm -hmm. that if you do one thing, that it's going to lead you down this terrible road to mm -hmm. genuine evil, to watching children being assaulted. That is like... And then when that's your metric of right and wrong, if, if it's truly a horribly, a horrible moral failing to be a man and have sex with a man or to kiss another man, but it's also a terrible moral failing to sexually assault a woman on a date, you know, it's like, how are you supposed to measure right from wrong when you're being told outright lies? about what is moral, what is immoral, and no one's being taught about consent. There's a whole another mm -hmm. issue. But like consent is never in the picture. I didn't hear Mike Todd speak about consent, not one time in that mm -hmm. sermon. And yeah, I just don't know what men are supposed to do with all of this. And yes, when women talk about not all men, and we are like, infuriated by that notion, it's it, the shark analogy is real. It's like, if you're swimming in a pool of sharks, I myself am like, well, I've been bitten about four times by sharks in a bad way. Mm -hmm. So sorry, if there's a shark that walks through my front door, I don't know if he's going to bite me or not. And that's just mm -hmm. the state of the world. And that's, that's what I've learned about men and their sexuality. And I know what message y'all are being given. You're beast, it's irrepressible, you have to battle. What if you're not battling hard enough mm -hmm. that day? that just means you might be a really unsafe person in my own home and that that really is what it is yeah. and on that point i just want to maybe end you can end it your own podcast i don't want to take over your <laughs> podcast here. Um, you're like anyway but, like subscribe share your friends <laughs> it reminds me of like the testosterone research is very complex and not super conclusive about cause and effect and there's one study in particular that really highlights how like the men that think like testosterone makes us this one irrepressible way um is that well first of all there's brain scans that show that like males and females um their brains light up the same when they're sexually aroused or very similarly but men attribute their s sexual drive as stronger than females do even though their brains are lighting up the same but the other thing with testosterone is that when men when fathers hear uh go to a baby crying the testosterone level drops and becomes more nurturing and when they ignore babies crying the testosterone levels spike and increase so it's like the i'm not denying biological components of 
being by uh, being born with a penis. Like I think that stuff does factor in, and hormones um, can be a part of our experiences being men. Um, but it's also how our behaviors shape our hormonal and emotional responses to things. Um, so yeah, I see that belief so much that men are like yeah that we have insane sex drives. Um, yeah, that, and it that gives our wives need to fulfill for us. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, it's Sorry. Just, it also gives a built-in excuse, which is which has been it's wreaked havoc all over the Christian atmosphere and many other places too. But mm -hmm. purity culture is completely aligned with rape culture. That that meme where um, Pam from the office is holding up those two signs. If there was one that's like purity culture and rape culture, it's like they're the same picture. I don't see a difference. And uh, purity culture doesn't even work. Like, imagine if, if it was still good to wait till sex. It's like people who have done purity balls or like purity rings, like on average, it, your first sexual encounter is delayed by 18 months. It's like... If that, yeah. 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 So I don't feel like we solved anything. What are we supposed to do? What is your final like bits of wisdom for any men listening? And then all of us that are having to <laughs> be around that those men that are listening uh, and love them. For the people that have been hurt by men, your anger is valid and understandable and you have the right to express that however you want, even if some of them are men is trash type way, even though I also don't like that and it doesn't fit for me, but I understand it. And for men, um, I do have an unshakable belief. I know Brene Brown talks about it a bit. Um, is that like you, we, I'll include me, we are good and that um, we are trying. And I do see men trying and getting lost in that confusion or they're trying to hold on to something that's really clear, um, that gender roles provide a sense of safety um, and just knowing like, this is my role. There is a sense of safety in that. Um, so yeah, just, I do believe I am an optimist that men are good and they're trying. Yeah. Well, even like you leading us to Brene Brown, because that sounds like a really good, like solution oriented way to be too. If, if, some men listening would just be open to listening to message like hers because that is all about vulnerability. Reading Peggy Ornstein's work on boys and sex, letting in these, these women's voices who are presenting themselves as safe spaces to land, who are full of research and compassion that might be able to stir your spirit and remind you of what you've been through. I think boys and sex particularly, particularly could be a very heartbreaking and traumatic book for a lot of men to read. Um, but it could also be so healing because you've all come against so much. And one of the most stunning things she, she talked about in her work is um, that infant boys show more responsiveness to emotions than infant girls. Yeah, they're more emotionally reactive to the age of two, and then girls become more emotionally expressive, but it's age of six when um, boys stop being more facially expressive than girls. So yeah, all signs point to boys being actually more emotionally responsive and expressive at a young age. Yeah. Which really shows, I think, so that socialization piece, especially around the start of school, is being very profound. Yeah, totally. And the the output of anger and rage and violence is not a surprising outcome to that repression, which is why you keep harping on embodiment, which mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more that embodiment is so key for all of us. Mm -hmm try dancing in your apartment for a minute, see how that feels, let yourself do it without the gender script of boys aren't supposed to be doing this or that or the other thing. Get your Harry Styles dress on and be like, whatever, I look great, who cares, you know? Follow figures that you see that are walking down these paths would be my advice. Follow the Harry Styles, listen to music that is compassionate towards women, that is compassionate towards mankind, 
look at researchers or documentaries, my octopus friend, watch men in their power, in their vulnerability, in their love for the planet and their love for their fellow mankind, in love for children, listen to educators that are working to raise healthier boys and men. And yeah, I think content and what you're ingesting is, is hugely important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I echo that for sure. Great. Now you end the podcast. <laughs> oh. I need Thank you all for listening. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for listening. If you listen the whole way through, I appreciate you. You're allowed to disagree with me. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. Um, again, it's remasculate, R-E-M-A-S-C-U-L-A-T-E dot org. And then that's at re.masculate on Instagram. And that's it. Thank you so much for being here. Please like, subscribe, share with your friends, donate to my Patreon or Venmo if you can. We love, we you, love all you all so, so much. much. God, God bless. bless.